السلام عليكم ورحمة الله اليوم في ضيافة كريمة من القنصلية في القناة جدة نصور السلام عليكم نختار جدار الصوت 135000 حصان خليكم معنا اليوم في هذه التفاصيل عندنا جماعة بيشرحوا بإيش الهندسة البريطانية وفين وصلوا فيها أنا لعمر 29 30 سنة محتفظين بالأرقام الكلاسيكية القياسية كلها وأسرع سيارات على الأرض خليكم معنا إن شاء الله اليوم نجيب التفاصيل عنها This is what the children say, and it's pretty much down to Top Gear. So Top Gear have promoted the Bugatti Veyron quite significantly as, as being a fast car. This is obviously the previous version, so they're going a little bit faster than 253 now. Uh, but in order to get that extra around about six miles an hour, they've had to reconfigure the engine, they've had to do a completely new, diff uh, new subframe, and they've had to completely redesign elements of the car. So very small amounts in terms of increase of speed is, is actually quite a difficult thing to achieve. But we don't call that a fast car, we think this is a fast car. So this is the first ever land speed record car. It was built in France. Uh, this was the first time the French ever held the land speed record and the last. Um, so basically they came and they did it once and then went away. The other interesting thing about this is 39.24 miles an hour. The bicycle record was around about 10 miles an hour faster at that particular point in time. The really interesting thing is electric, so, so electric is nothing new. So again, a lot of the technologies we use for this form of engineering repeat themselves. But this is where a lot of people um, remember land speed record coming in. So there's a gentleman at the back just talking to me about the Campbell dynasty. Um, we'll come on to that in a minute, but this is one of my favourite cars. This is called Golden Arrow. And in 1929, it was going almost as fast as the Bugatti Veyron does today. So 231 miles an hour. The other really impressive thing about this is if you see the sea at the back there, they're running on a beach in, in the UK and Wales. And, and it's really pity that the sand's really difficult to drive on and the car's sliding all over the place and you get a whole pile of um, uh, dust and uh, all sorts of gravel coming up. And as you can see here, the driver has actually taken his goggles off because he can't see because of all the sand going in his eyes. So this gentleman here is driving this monster of a car along a beach, 231 miles an hour in 1929, with no goggles on. These, these people that drive these cars are just quite incredible. We then come on to, to the Camel Dynasty, so, so again, one that a lot of people remember. So by 1935, we'd moved from the UK over to the US because their beaches were longer, and, uh, and we're doing 301 miles an hour. Again, you can see exactly the same thing right next to the seafront over here, and if you look over there in the corner, then, then they haven't got their goggles on the game, that's to take them off. So by 1935, in land speed record terms, we were doing faster than, than most of the land cars uh, do today. So, so it's quite an incredible achievement in terms of moving that process forward. But we don't think that's a fast car, we think that this is a fast car. That stands for supersonic car. Again, when I'm speaking to school children, this talk teaches a lot of science. So the first thing I ask is, what can't you see? What can't you see? The car itself. 
You can't see the car because it's coming over the curvature of the Earth. It's around about six miles away. So now we're coming over the top of the curvature of the Earth. We're just seeing it now. This is a film. What else can't you hear? Any sound? Yes. Listen, Jordan. So in that really simple piece of video, what you're actually doing is first of all proving that the Earth is round as it goes over the top of the curvature of the Earth. Light travels significantly faster than sound because you can see all of that stuff going on before, before you heard it. And in addition to that, when you build up enough momentum and you actually build in the force fields in front of the car, you get a sonic boom. And there was actually two sonic booms, but in actual fact it was three. So normally you can hear it. So as it hit the front of the car, as it hit the cockpit, and then as it hit the tail. The really interesting thing about that is the person that's never heard that live is Andy Green, the person who drove the car. So because he's driving really fast and all the engine noise is, is around about three miles behind him. In exactly the same way as Concorde used to be really quiet when he actually went, went inside it. As soon as you started to go supersonic, the noise of the engines were actually three miles away. So all the time it was going really quick, it was really quiet. It's a beautiful thing. But you can see by using these types of things that, that there is a lot of science associated with it in an easy, really easy way. This is a really iconic picture as well. So this was taken by a gentleman flying a microlight. So he was flying a microlight trying to get some beautiful pictures and he got this magnificent picture here. And as you can see, it's just coming up to dawn and you're starting to see the shock waves coming out of the car. That's not smoke coming out the back end of the car. What we're doing is destroying the surface around about 18 inches into the ground with all the forces that are going in terms of the vehicle itself. Destroying the surface before we actually get close to it. The really scary thing about this car was because it had a dual engine, there wasn't enough room to put the pivot in terms of the steering on the front of the car. So it was a rear wheel steered car. So basically Andy was driving at 763 miles an hour, just past the speed of sound, uh, driving a shopping trolley. Really scary thing to do. <laughs> and around about 600 miles an hour, you can see by some of these tracks up here, uh, it used to veer off to the left. And so what Andy used to have to do is, as it veered off to the left, he used to have to go on full lock whilst keeping the power on, slide it back across the, the line because there's a line that he's following, and basically he's following a T. So you can see the horizon in the distance, and you've got a white line that he's trying to follow, which is like this. So he's got to keep on the line, otherwise he can disappear off in the wrong direction. And then as he slides back over the line, he goes on full lock again and then accelerates to kick the back end in and then accelerate. And if you ever watch the video, all Andy's saying is the car is yawing. And he takes it really calmly in a real sort of nonchalant way. But in actual fact, he broke the steering wheel um, because he was gripping it so hard once uh, as he was trying to steer the vehicle out, out, out this particular slide. But in addition to that, you can see the shock waves going down, up and into the ground. Um, they also went up in the air. Um, and the gentleman flying the microlight was flying around, forgot all about it because he was getting some really good pictures, and the shock wave went up in the air, flipped him over three times and thought he was going to die. So, so we'll never ever get a picture like this taken by a person again, which is why I really like this one. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to fly drones really close to it because we don't mind smashing them up. We smash up a lot of cameras already, uh, and I think when we're actually doing the run of the car, we're going to smash up a lot more. So you think... So 
uh, heat resistant uh, understructural camera which we destroyed straight away. <laughs> and you can see here that was the Cosworth engine initially coming in and then that's firing at around about 20%. So these were all of the cameras we had. We were running it very rich, so, so we wouldn't have that much flame uh, when we were actually running the vehicle properly. Uh, but what we wanted to do was to test it under stress. Um, I much prefer this one. So, so what I was trying to do is I was trying to get some books in for our VIPs, and, um, and the gentleman turned up late in a white van. And he sat outside. And, uh, and he phoned me up and he said, all the gates are shut, I can't come in, I'm going to go away. I said, no, please don't go away because you've got stuff I want. He said, no, no, no I'm going to go away. I said, look, look, the airport is closed for a moment because it's a safety thing. Uh, please don't come in, um, but please wait for me and I promise I'll make it worth your while. So he's sitting on the outside gate. And bearing in mind, this is a full-size aircraft hangar. We're about 500 metres away. Uh, this is what he saw. <laughs> Cosworth engine running. The Cosworth people said, could you turn the speakers up? Uh, we didn't have any speakers, which I thought was really fun. issues. We've got a lot of the systems in and, and this was the nice flood lit area um, but, but the other side we, we left open so everybody can actually see the engineering. You can see at the back there those are the air brakes that come out to slow the car down and you can see that we're actually running, running on rubber. So, so hopefully this year we're going to be running this version of the car around about 200 miles an hour up and down runways in the UK in, in Newquay um, to make sure that everything works. The really nice thing about Bantam Newquay is that it means that if anything doesn't work, we know what we haven't got. Because by the time we get to Uppington, it's going to be a really difficult thing for the hat skin pan to say, I haven't got a 10 mil spanner, would you please go and get me one? So, so we're making sure we've got everything we need and we pack everything we need. So this is where we are now. So by this year, uh, we're going to have a car running in the UK. Um, we should have had the car going to Africa this year. Uh, we've had problems with, with, with one of our main sponsors, which is a real shame. And, uh, and therefore, we're looking for additional sponsorship as well. Yeah, so, so that's we'll talk about that a little more. Um, but there's a number of ways that you can help us. Again, you can have your name on the figure of the car. Um, it's very cheap. I've got no idea what it is in Durham, but it's very cheap. You can have your picture put on. Um, you can also, um, if you want to, sponsor it from, from an organisation. <laughs> Areas where we're storing the car on, on the desert, on, on the salt pan. That's the control center that I was talking about earlier that receives all of the information and then beams it up into the MTN towers onto the internet. I had a 10 year old ask why Andy was accelerating his left foot, which I thought was really good. In actual fact, what he's doing is he's holding the car as he starts the engine. So when you see his feet move, a 10 year old spotted that, that they were doing something quite odd. You can see that's where all of the engines are and the fuel cells are even sitting right behind where the driver sits. We start off with the purifier and we start fairly slow because we don't want to suck too many stones, even the small ones, into the engine. So he's holding on the brake now, he starts to use the purifier engine, he's lifting his foot off and he starts to accelerate.
entering the measure time. We're doing one, two, sorry, one, two, three. We're out of the measured mile. So the mile takes less less than three seconds. We now start to slow the car down. By turning the engines off, we lose 140 miles an hour out of speed. So basically a head-on car crash on a motorway, we call that dec deceleration. We then put the air brakes out, which destroys the aerodynamics of the car, and we gradually bring it to a halt using normal brakes. We've got parachutes in reserve, just in case we need them. Uh, but then what we do is we circle the car around, letting the Eurofighter engine cool down. We recheck the vehicle to make sure it's safe. And, uh, and then we, we actually have a system where everybody has to say it's safe, otherwise the car won't run. And then